Hi everyone, I'm Sunku Ranganath. I'm a network software engineer in Intel, working on enabling service mesh for 5G and edge environments. Topic today I'm presenting titled, Are you sure about your mesh performance? Details matter, along with uh, Mythica and Auto. Here's the legal disclaimer. High level agenda, we start off looking at some of the important aspects to keep in mind while measuring your mesh deployment. Uh, we then share the, some of the results and observations uh, with the performance studies we have done on bare metal and virtualized environment. Otto would then talk about some of the benchmarking pitfalls around tooling and test environment. And Mythica would end the talk uh, sharing some of the ongoing work. So if you're someone looking to understand your mesh deployment, you would uh, start off setting up your cluster, your service mesh application or test, pick a benchmarking tool, configure your transactions per second uh, or protocol of interest, test duration, connections, then run the test and capture the results. However, if you closely look at this picture, what's missing? Right, so it turns out quite a lot. For the purposes of this talk, let's assume um, east-west traffic is traffic between microservices, either in the same pod or across the pods, um, either on the same virtual machine or across different virtual machines or across different hosts. And not so traffic is something, uh, traffic coming in and out of a specific host. So depending on how you configure the number of hops between your source and destination, the, your mesh performance has a huge impact. For example, your uh, load balancer, your API gateways, ingress controllers, firewall, all of these add um, a good amount of latency uh, impacting overall performance of your mesh. Not just that, uh, right? So your hardware settings related to your BIOS settings power management, NUMA awareness, type of accelerators, or your operating system settings, type of networking stack you would use, kernel versus user plane stack, or the type of tuning you would do across your L2, L3 layer, right? And your load generator settings, all of these have a good amount of impact on your mesh performance. So for the, um, ultimately what's important is to have a method to have a consistent results across um, a repeated number of uh, test cycles, right? So that's the crucial part. So uh, we started off looking at uh, performance of Envoy, uh, leveraging the Envoy Sprint Proxy Sandbox, available part of the Envoy source code. By the way, if you're someone new looking to understand service mesh with Envoy, um, uh, front pro uh, the sandboxes provided um, are a really great way to understand, uh, which is where I was uh, just a few short months ago. Uh, so in this example, front proxy, uh, Sandbox provides a simple envoy acting as a load balancer at the front, uh, servicing two services, service one, service two, each of them having a simple Flask app and envoy as a sidecar process in a, in a Docker container. So type of test we do is scale the number of service one endpoints from either anyway from one to 100. Uh, look at the amount of uh, transactions resolved, tail latency, uh, change the traffic generator settings. So ultimately, what we're trying to understand is um, performance impact with uh, scaling the number of cores or a number of connections, uh, along with uh, scaling the number of Flask or Envoy instances. So to give you an idea of results, so if you look at here uh, on the x-axis, you have a number of um, app or Envoy uh, microservices from anywhere from two to 100. And y-axis here, uh, one side you have the transactions result, other side you have latency. You could see from the bar graphs of, with the one core versus two versus four cores, especially if you have, when you have a higher container count, about 100, um, a, a thousand TPS input, uh, you could see with four cores, all the thousand have been successfully resolved versus one core where it not even reached to the 200 TPS. And your P99 latency has a huge impact of 4.5 times when you have four cores available and keeping it steady. And when you scale it across the entire socket with 48 cores, you could see uh, at 10,000 TPS input, you could see you could achieve a, a well over 7,000 TPS with the whole socket versus uh, four cores, which is uh, uh, about 200 in this case, uh, at 10,000 TPS input and with 64 connections, versus um, your tail latencies uh, where they're being steady across the 10,000 TPS input uh, versus the four core case where your latency goes well over seconds. Uh, 
one second. Uh, if you look at the CPU utilization across these four cores, and when you cross uh, 1000 TPS input rate, your CPU utilization uh, for your flask app and sidecar proxy goes be close to 100%, right? Anything over 1000, right, so reaching 100%, which is, which is a lot. So essentially, we found that uh, the number of cores have a significant impact on overall mesh performance. Uh, isolated cores and core pinning aren't necessarily helpful, which is what some of the telco deployments do, right? Isolate the cores and pin the microservices, right? So it's not necessarily helpful. And we found that uh, we could do a, quite a lot of optimizations to achieve uh, better performance, uh, even compared to what's here. So here's an example of a, a telco deployment where you would have a Kubernetes in a virtual machine, either in um, uh, 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 same host, different host, right? So um, in this example, we did uh, master, uh, Kubernetes master and work one VM on one host and Kubernetes work on a different host. And we would look at uh, Calico and Istio with their defaults. Um, and on the worker host um, for the data plane, uh, we'd use OBS DPDK, right? So some of the telco deployments use either OBS DPDK or SIOE uh, type of scenarios. In this example, we have two Polymer drivers um, servicing the data plane traffic. And uh, the idea is to understand the impact of Istio in this type of deployment. Right? And Ford IO client uh, would uh, talk to Nginx web server running in a pod along with uh, Envoy sidecar proxy. I have two configurations here, front Ford IO client running as a process outside of Kubernetes cluster, either within um, the Kubernetes master VM or on the bare metal host. And the idea is to understand uh, the north south traffic going in and out of this host. So to give you a um, brief uh, view of the results, right, so the, for the VM to VM case where Ford IO in VM versus Nginx pod in another VM, and there are two different hosts, you could see adding Istio um, adds about three times the latency across different TPS rate. And um, at about 10,000 TPS, uh, where without Istio, you could resolve 10,000 TPS, Istio adds in about 46% um, performance degradation. And uh, um, with respect to the case where Ford IO is on the master host, uh, reaching the Nginx pod in the VM, Istio adds about four times the latency and about 11% 11, 11 performance degradation about 10,000 DPS rate. And IPO of traffic, you could see uh, anywhere from 32 to 60%, depending on the case, right? Um, so essentially what we found is um, there's a good amount of performance impact adding Istio in a virtualized environment. And we could see um, the could tune across the stack, starting from CPUs, in this case, we have 10 uh, cores made available for VM, right? So uh, CPU number of cores, uh, type of cores, Calico config or M with respect to MTU, a connection rate, um, right? Or your Envoy config with respect to number of cores versus number of Envoy worker threads, right? So there are a lot of variables across the stack that we could look into or tune into. Few observations, so hardware tuning a lot of things could be done. Uh, for example, power management policies, um, simple thing to do is turn off all power management options. However, we found uh, de depending on the P states and C state config, they have a good impact on tail latencies. Enabling hyperthreading uh, improves performance. Uh, core isolation isn't necessarily helpful, for example, uh, some of the cases we described earlier uh, with bare metal tests. Right? Uh, impact of tuning a VM for numer locality or Pinning uh, QME threads uh, on, on the isolated cores have a, a good impact on tail latencies. Uh, you could do save uh, CPU cycles when your CPU is idling, or offload crypto operations, for example, leveraging Intel Quick Assist technology, or add vectorized code as another solution. On the other side, from a load generator perspective, there are quite a few things to it, as it adds its own latency, leveraging kernel networking stack. Right. Uh, so the latency has a huge impact um, depending on the back of algorithm used or, uh, and we found that some of the optimizations could be done with respect to resources, CPU or hardware tuning, microarchitectural analysis, uh, metrics based, uh, based feedback loop, which is how some of the hardware uh, traffic generators do. Uh, 
uh, Otto would uh, touch upon some of these uh, in his uh, part. Um, also, we found uh, some of the L2, L3 uh, traffic generators leverage RFC 2544, uh, but uh, for L7 benchmarking, we haven't found load generator leveraging in a standardized way. Right, so we could see overall um, optimizations could be done from a load generator perspective across the stack, et cetera. In fact, um, we've been discussing a lot of this work as part of uh, CNCF Service Mesh Working Group, uh, which is part of a uh, SIG network. And um, uh, the, the project we've been talking about, uh, a lot of these aspects is Service Mesh Performance. In fact, this uh, project has been submitted to CNCF uh, to be considered as a sandbox project. Essentially, SMB provides a standardized way of uh, running these mesh uh, performance measurements, um, looking at a um, uh, vendor neutral way of uh, specifying mesh deployment patterns, your environment, infrastructure, capturing your test results, essentially in an automated way, for example, leveraging meshery, right? And, um, so uh, this is where, uh, in fact, I met Otto for the first time, and we had a quite a few fruitful, fruitful conversations after that. So with that, uh, pass it on to Otto. Hello, my name is Otto van der Schaaf, and I work as a principal envoy engineer at Red Hat with a focus on performance. I am an active contributor to Envoy Proxy slash Nighthawk, a layer 7 performance characterization tool. In this presentation, I will share some of the pitfalls and observations I have run into while measuring performance of proxies and meshes. To start out, I will dive into load generator tooling for a bit and dig into some of the divergences between them. To illustrate it, it is nice to visit a performance issue that was at some point reported in the open source Envoy repository, which compared Envoy Proxy to HI Proxy. In that test, WRK2 was used to compare latencies across the two proxies, and Envoy seemed to add two or three times as much latency. At some point, I figured that sanity checking these lit numbers was where I warranted. So I set up a reproduction. And next to WRK, I used Fort.io and Nighthawk to measure latencies. While doing so, WRK reproduced mean latencies in the right ballpark, but Fort.io reported latencies about twice as high, and Nighthawk would in turn report latencies an order of magnitude lower. They couldn't all possibly be right. In the discussion that followed, we learned that the reported measurements had been obtained by executing on a virtual machine, whereas my reproduction was on a tuned bare metal machine. Still, that did not explain the divergence between Nighthawk and the other tools. To understand what happened there, we need to dig into the subtleties around request release timings and connection reuse. Let's take a look at different strategies that a load generator could use when releasing requests in terms of timings and connections. In the display diagram, on the vertical axis, four rows are representing four connections. The x-axis represents time. We're shooting for four queries per second. As you can see, this diagram shows a perfectly timed request release each quarter of a second, balancing over all the connections that are available. The same connection and queries per second parameterization can be expressed in alternative ways. For example, a load gen might depend on internal or external HTTP libraries which will not prefetch connections. This could in turn mean that only a single connection is actually involved, where one might naively think um, that four would have been involved. The specified amount of connection serves as a maximum in this case, but not, a, not as a minimum. A load generator may also rely on a pool with prefetching capabilities. When testing low latency replies, four connections will be created in this scenario, but only one will be used for sending requests. Connection pools tend to use a most recently used strategy when picking a free connection from the available ones. Depending on the specifics of what is being tested, a single or a few large pools behaving like this may or may not be desirable. When realistically trying to simulate browsers, it is probably better to have lots of small pool instances that behave like this. 
when simulating a downstream proxy, one or only a large few of these pools may reflect reality. So this diagram visualizes yet another way of releasing a request as observed in the wild. Timing request releases would occur in a bit of a synchronized fashion across connections. Note that this still reflects four queries per second, but it may not be what someone has in mind. Now in the previous diagrams, we had to request reply pairs fast enough to never have connections saturated when it is time to release a new request. This diagram visualizes a situation where all connections are busy and it is time to issue a new request. Load generators diverge here in how they handle this. Closed loop load generators may just block and release when a connection frees up. Some track time being blocked. Others will try to use math to correct for missed requests in histogram output. Open loop generators may report connection and stream overflows. Regardless of closed or open loop methodology, some may allow queuing. What happens with the request release pacing varies too. A low gen may or may not try to make up for missed request releases by increasing the pacing when possible, depending on implementation. Here's an example of Nighthawk warning about time spent being blocked on resources, connections in this case, when it ran in closed loop mode. We advise to consider results as invalid when significant blocking is observed, as latency histograms will be useless for most purposes. The next slide shows it reporting pool overflows in open loop mode. Likewise, when significant connection or stream overflows are detected, those numbers can be checked as part of verifying test expectations through structured output. So let's dig into two load generators for a bit. Um, let me try to explain this plot for a bit. On the vertical axis, bottom to top, we have Fortio and WRK ramping up from 50 to 4000 QPS. This execution used a single connection and was assigned a single CPU. We plot a series of P50 latency measurements on the horizontal axis to get a sense of the numbers and the spread. What stood out here is that WRK generally reports an order of magnitude lower latencies compared to Fortio and that its stability across test executions was much tighter. The next slide is similar but uses 200 connections and 4 CPUs and it tracks P99.9 .9, which is a little bit more ambitious. What seems to be a quirk in WRK emerges. The, the 50 and 250 QPN runs yield no output and the 500 QPS one looks pretty weird. Here we show the same plots, but now from Envoy's access logs, which served as a control measurement in the experiment. So WRK was sending traffic where we missed the output, and it doesn't look that out of the ordinary. Manual investigation of request arrival timings at the test subject showed that Fortio would yield traffic that was bursty in comparison to WRK. This turned out to be a dominant factor in the observed divergence in measured latencies. Later on, a jitter flag was added to Fortio to desynchronize request release timings, which, which reduced divergence. This may suffice until one wants to define tests in terms of random distributions around request release timings. Anyway, the learning here is to know your tools and have well-defined tests. Different tools come with different weaknesses, strengths, and implied characteristics. Some other gotchas observed in the wild. Latency measurement tooling may diverge when it comes to handling in-flight requests post-execution. -ex Some tools may include status and or latency in their reporting. Also, the math around tracking rolling standard deviations and histograms isn't trivial. Floating point math is used here, and it may be subject to a phenomena called catastrophical cancellation when using a naive approach. And through that, tooling can produce distorted numbers. When comparing baselines of different servers and meshes, or even across load generators, it is good to be aware that diverging TLS ciphers and or session reuse characteristics in setups may translate into significant latency divergences. <laughs>
So when it comes to reporting results, it is common for a tooling to produce a single histogram. Sometimes, however, being able to dive a bit deeper is useful. This example shows a single globally aggregated histogram on the left. It is under, its underlying data comes from measurements across multiple distinct workers which run on different threads. The workers all use their own connection pool. The plot shows a broken knee, which is kind of odd. On the right, we visualize the output once more, but now we also include the per worker plots. Those all look as regular latency plots, and now it's much easier to see how the aggregated view obtained its odd shape. The plots displayed in the previous slide often point to a phenomena called backend hotspotting. This diagram tries to visualize the phenomena. The connections from the load generator didn't end up in a balanced way at the test subject's processing capacities. One listener has three connections, while the other one has just a single one. In perfect keep alive tests, this may not, out this may not automatically rebalance. And in setups with chain proxies like meshes, this may even cascade through the system. Fortunately, Envoy has some mitigations around this today, but your mileage may vary depending on the technology you are running tests against. Unless you are specifically testing this aspect of a system, it might be good to explicitly limit connection reuse to allow for balancing opportunities when running into this. Here's a list of things that may complicate reasoning when measuring latency. Noisy neighbors in virtualized setups may sometimes cause instability between results of distinct test executions. Competing processes may introduce, introduce noise too. If you are after getting things as easy to reason about as possible and obtaining the most predictable results, then CPU frequency changes and hyperthreading may not be your best friends, especially when testing surface meshes. In my experience, Experience, it is good to start out small and simple and build from there when trying to load test large and complex meshes. Load generators aside, following the earlier observations, it might be good to define load tests a bit more narrowly than just queries per second over a number of connections. There seem to be many implicit choices across load generators and from the outside, it's not always obvious what those are. Talking about test definitions, Google recently contributed an adaptive load controller feature to Nighthawk. That feature makes it easy to perform SLA-based testing to get answers to questions like How many queries per second can my system sustain given these resource constraints under set latency while observing at most X errors? The adaptive load controller will then repeatedly reparameterize test execution to see convergence on the optimum QPS that fits this. So this concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Mritika, off to you. Thanks, Otto. As a continuation of the bottleneck analysis, we would like to propose some next steps. Let's look at the ingress connection on the left-hand side of the diagram here that can be distributed among multiple worker threads, uh, the label one. Uh, so worker threads uh, that are waiting for traffic versus threads that have uh, traffic to microservices that are active, but disbalanced. Look at the bypassing of some of the Linux scheduling here and instead um, use core-based balancing. So multiple cores being used to balance out multiple worker threads being scheduled. Maybe have a priority among them. The other bottleneck to analyze is that associated with memory copy. Uh, between proxies, uh, proxies to microservices labeled as two here. And how do we accelerate some of those bottlenecks? For example, DMA copies using vectorized instructions like AVX 512 uh, for small memory copies. Larger copies um, going down frame processing or TCP text stack flows um, that can be offloaded using DMA offload engines in the CPU. Directly receiving the traffic packet from the NIC to a CPU port at the proxy, as shown in the right-hand side of, of the file here, um, and then using, uh, uh, you know, bypassing the kernel, um, and then using uh, an acceleration. Once you receive the packet, um, how do you use DMA engine to offload some of the copies that are happening from the proxy to the microservices? 
So in summary, um, achieving a QPS of more than 50K and latency of uh, less than five milliseconds in the current setup is one of our goals. This performance within a CNI plus proxy in a virtualized environment is a formidable goal we are targeting. If you want to join some of our analysis, let us know. Connect with us and we should be able to achieve some of these goals and present in a future session. Thank you.